Welcome to the Global Hydrogen Interview Series, where we ask what's next in a market that could account for 20% of global carbon abatement by 2050. Thank you very much to Alex Apprentice, the commercial manager at the Global CCS Institute for stretching his clock to join us today from Australia. Thank you, Alex. My pleasure, Michelle. Happy to speak with you today. Well, should we kick up for some sentiment? Let's set the scene in terms of how would you describe the feeling, the sentiment surrounding CCS at the moment against the background of blue carb, uh, blue hydrogen growth figures. What's what's the response that you're getting at the moment? Well, I think speaking generally about CCS, we've seen an enormous increase in demand for CCS over the past mm -hmm. few years. Um, in fact, the growth in projects, the growth in investment has been uh, quite frankly remarkable. Um, in fact, if you look at the, the 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 project pipeline, this is across all CCS projects, not just hydrogen. Um, it's been uh, growing strongly year on year since 2017, uh, mm -hmm. to the extent that we now have 172 commercial CCS facilities in all stages of development, 29 of those are operating, the remainder are um, uh, in stages of development, including construction, feed, etc. Um, 172 commercial CCS facilities in our database, um, and these are not pilots for demonstration, these are large scale commercial facilities. And it's grown, as I said, very, very rapidly. So when we completed our status report, which, which is our premier annual publication in September of last year, approximately, we had 135, I think, facilities in our database. Wow. When I updated it, uh, up, when I went back into our database to check the numbers literally last week, it had grown to 172. So there's about wow. 35, I think, facilities that have been added uh, in the intervening period between September and uh, and 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 last week, and, and there's actually more than that because um, uh, we have a backlog of at least twenty facilities that we're currently vetting um, to make sure they're real projects and not just academic studies or or uh, or, or just press releases. There needs to be, you know, a line of sight if they, if it gets through studies to steel on the ground. So when, CCS has been growing very strongly over the past uh, past four years. When do you think those twenty the vetting on those twenty will be? confirmed when do you think will be 190 potentially potentially uh well i mean we're constantly trying to bet them uh, i i guess over the next month or two it depends on resourcing um okay that's um, quite quick it also depends on how quickly the the uh, proponents of those facilities come back to us because part of our process of course is to check with them ask them some questions get them to confirm uh the data that we have to make sure it's uh, correct so over the next couple of months, hopefully we'll get we'll get through those. But th we, there's always a backlog. There's always a backlog. Um, there are announcements of new CCS studies on on, on projects uh, every week, literally every week. Mm. But that's a positive. A backlog's a positive. It means that there's momentum mm. in the market. Absolutely. Things are, things are moving. And then um, the the ideal, of course, is that the majority of that backlog is quality. Um, rather, rather than noise, which, as you as you said, from the bleep we've had from one five right. last September to one seven two now, that's that and, there is quality and, in there. Correct, and not all of them, of course, will make it through to FID and construction. Um, CCS, like any large industrial capital intense project, you know, some of them make it through, some of them get to a point and find that uh, they're commercially not feasible and they stop. CCS is no different there um, to any other uh, uh, industry, really. Do you have a percentage or a rough number in mind of, of how much of, I mean, we've got 172 as a total, 29 are operating at the moment. Of the rest that, as you say, are still in, in that process phase, do you have an idea of how many you're confident will make it to the end? No, not really. I, I really don't. Um, there are so many factors many that come factors. into play. So many factors that come into play. Each, each project uh, has to be considered on its own merits, um, as the proponents do, of course. So... I couldn't even hazard a guess. How many uh, how many years does it take on average at the moment with the current level of interest, current uh, financial fluidity as well surrounding these projects mm. to get from, yes, we'd like to do this to now it's operating? Depends on where you're starting mm. um, and depends very much on the existing infrastructure that's in place. So. Uh, if you were looking at uh, developing a new CCS project from scratch and, and you had very little geological data, for example, uh, to identify your storage resource, 
um, uh, re in, realistically, it's probably eight years um, between making yeah. the decision to commence studies to injecting carbon dioxide uh, into the ground. Because what you need to do is you need to put in place an exploration program to collect data on, on storage resources. Um, uh, now, that whole program could be delivered in two years, but it's not that simple because other people are also competing with you for access to drill rigs, uh, to ships if it's offshore, to the expertise to, to uh, analyse all of the seismic data which is collected. So, so in theory, you can probably do that in less than two years, but in reality, it can wow. take longer because of access to resources. Um, and then, of course, there's no guarantee that the first place you look will be will be suitable. Of you know? course. The, the, of course. The, 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 you might have preliminary data that indicates that's a really prospective area for storage, but then when you go and collect some 3D seismic or drill a well, you might find that, in fact, it's not. You need to look somewhere else. So, so I think, realistically, it's probably eight years. Um, yes. If you already have excellent knowledge of your geology, so, for example, you're an oil and gas company um, uh, producing gas or oil, uh, and you've already got that data over your potential storage site, courtesy of oil or gas exploration, um, uh, then the time frame can be much shorter. Um, you know, because you don't, because there's much less time required to collect the data, there's, there's much less time to analyze the data because you've already done it for other reasons. Uh, and, and often the infrastructure is also uh, already there or elements of it are already there or approvals are already there because you're already producing oil or gas and injecting CO2 um, uh, from an, uh, uh, an industrial perspective is really very similar. In fact, it's the day job of, of oil and gas industry. They do it I was going to say the culture day. is already embedded to a degree, isn't exactly. it? Exactly. So, so you can, if, 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 if the circumstances are correct, you already have good geological data, your facilities are already well established, you, you, you can probably get a facility up uh, within three or, maybe three or four years. But, but, but on average, I think it's going to be more like, you know, heading up towards, towards eight years. And how does that impact the flow of investment towards this market, this eight years on average? I, I know it's a bit different per country, per mm. geological. There's so many factors, and, and I, I appreciate that eight years is, is a generalisation. But how Very does general, it, yeah. Yeah. How does it um, impact the investment ap appetite for these big financings that can take mm. eight years to develop in a market that blue hydrogen has its critics and then looking further afield, green hydrogen and a lot of momentum saying that that will take the lead in the 2030s so how mm. how to balance that investment conversation well i think what's happening is the shorter term uh opportunities are being developed first uh mm. so so um i think it's safe to assume that investors in ccs will invest rationally so they're not going to pick the hardest most expensive opportunities right. first they're going to pick the easiest least expensive opportunities first in fact that's what we're seeing so um uh, pivoting to hydrogen, um, so blue hydrogen specifically, um, in our status report published in September of last year, or October of last year, there were 18 new blue hydrogen facilities in development. And all of those um, uh, uh, announced that they will be in uh, operation uh, in the mid 2020s. So the first of those hope to be operating by 2022 this year. Mm, mm. Um, uh, uh, the, 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 the ones with the longest timeline hope to be operating by 2027. Okay. So 18 new facilities, all to produce hydrogen with CCS, blue hydrogen, um, and all targeting commencement dates of operation roughly mid this, mid, mid this decade. So, so these are clearly shorter. Uh, shorter duration, easier opportunities to develop. Some of them are retrofits on existing hydrogen production yeah. facilities, but but some of them are not. Some of them are brand new facilities uh, built from the ground up, uh, built to produce hydrogen uh, to sell as a as a clean energy carrier uh, using newer uh, hydrogen production technology. So they're not going to be using SMR or steam methane reformation. Um, SMR is the best technology if you're not concerned about emissions. Yeah. Right. But if you which are concerned are. about emissions, <laughs> which we are, which we are, otherwise, why would you bother? Right. So, so um, uh, uh, the best technologies for, sorry, if you are concerned about emissions, you choose a different technology, which, which, which uh, provides you with only high concentration CO2 streams, which are less costly to capture and give you much higher rates of capture, sort of 95%. 99% actually, um, you can you can get to. So they'll be using uh, 
autothermal reforming, they'll be using partial oxidation. They won't be using SMR. And so how does this feed into the scale side of things? Because as you say, you know, the mm. 18 new blue hydrogen facilities, that that in itself, we're, we're talking about projects as a standalone mm. growth area, that's huge. But if mm. we're talking about that level of growth in the much bigger picture and the huge numbers that we're seeing for, um, for blue hydrogen or um, mm. and green hydrogen demand, um, as part of this mixed energy basket, as part of meeting rising demand amid climate targets, then that number starts starts to get smaller, especially if we're thinking that the other projects coming forward with CCS are going to be some of the not as easy to reach and some of the projects that could take six to eight years. So hmm. how do you, where, where do you stand on that issue of scale? So one of the advantages that blue hydrogen has is scale. Um, so so um, where do I start? Right now, there are seven facilities that produce hydrogen with CCS operating, uh, and they all produce between 200 and 1,300 tonnes of hydrogen per day, per day, not per year. Um, the total capacity of those operating facilities is around about one and a half million tonnes of clean hydrogen uh, per year, right? Total capacity of all seven combined. Um, mm. The first of those facilities started operating in 1982. So this is not new, right? But this is, this is SMR, right? So older, the other uh, uh, form of uh, 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 gasification of, of, of um, sorry, uh, reformation of methane, or they gasify coal. Um, uh, I mentioned earlier that there, were, there are 18 new facilities in development mm -hmm. as of our status report of September, October last year. Which I, I recommend everybody has, has a read of. It's very interesting and uh, it's very nice, easy to digest if you're very busy. So, um, yes. Thank you, yes. It's a very good Thank read. you, yes. No, it, it is well read, uh, well, well written. Um, I checked our database just immediately before this call and did a quick count of the hydrogen facilities. There's now 26 in development. Wow. So uh, it's grown from 18 to 26 since September last year. Um, and as I said, scale is something that blue hydrogen has a significant advantage in. So a small hydrogen production facility uh, from coal or gas with CCS would produce three, 400,000 tonnes per year, a small one. Mm. Um, the CCS loves scale, right? Scale brings down cost. So I think what we're going to see is, is, is pl more plants that produce uh, like the one in the US, 1,300 per day, 1,300 tonnes per day. Not uh, so, so scale is something that, that blue hydrogen has a massive advantage in. Um, uh, you know, I think, I think the Middle East is going to be massive in blue hydrogen. You know, there have been announcements, uh, Saudi Arabia, for example, about the new Jafura, I think it's how you pronounce it, gas field, a significant proportion of that yep. gas is going to be hypothecated to blue hydrogen production. So Saudi Arabia, the Middle East, in fact, more generally, has all of the ingredients necessary to be a massive supplier of clean hydrogen, blue and green, actually, mm, blue mm. and green, which is good news for the climate uh, because they've got uh, lots and lots of very low cost hydrocarbons, right? Get lots of gas, lots of oil. Uh, mm. They've got lots and lots of really good storage geology that they, that they know about because they've been exploring the region uh, forever and they've got all that data collected. Uh, they've got a strategic imperative to decarbonize their Indeed. product um, so so you know it makes good business sense to invest in blue hydrogen production there's, to there's to maintain also real the value proximity. there's always also real proximity of a lot of the facilities as well isn't there absolutely absolutely they've got the industrial infrastructure there to support it they've got lots and lots of land with low opportunity mm. cost um, so that lends itself to actually to green hydrogen also so the uh, NEOM project, for example, the NEOM city, yeah. clean city in, in Saudi, they're going to have a massive green hydrogen production facility there because they have lots of land on which they can put thousands of square kilometres of solar PV and wind um, uh, to provide enough electricity to make, you know, really large quantities of, of green hydrogen. So, so I, think, I think actually hydrogen production can scale up, clean hydrogen production can scale up pretty quickly. Uh, it's still an enormous challenge to get to the 500 million tonnes plus per year that we need by mid-century. But blue hydrogen gives us the opportunity to really give that a nudge because, as I said, you know, a single facility typically will be hundreds of thousands of tonnes per year. Mm. Um, and, and the investment is starting to come. You know, 18 September in development, as of now, when I just checked, according to our database, and there's probably more, 26. 
Are those verified projects? So they, those are the ones that have been vetted, the 26? Yes, they're yeah. the ones that are in our in our database. Some of them are just announced. Others are in, in pre-feasibility, feasibility studies feed. Some are under construction already. That, so, that's that, that's uh, certainly a big leap because in the Middle East, um, for example, the UAE, Saudi especially, are very yeah. publicly stating becoming global hydrogen champions and leaders by Absolutely. 2030. It's only eight years away and there's only really two established CCS projects in those countries, you know, one each essentially so far. Um, and eight years isn't very much. I think we can all agree we blink and somehow we've lost six months. So uh, it's, it's, not very, it's not very much, but if you've got knowledge of your geology, you've got the technical expertise, I mean, Chad, you've got SABIC, you know, this is uh, very easy for them. It's very familiar technology, for example. Mm. Um, you've got the strategic driver, you've got the capital to invest. It can, it can, they could easily be producing, you know, massive amounts, thousands of tonnes per day of clean hydrogen well before 2030, in, in, in my view. In, in the UAE and in Saudi, in your opinion? Uh, well, definitely in Saudi. I'm not so familiar with, with UAE, but, um, uh, you know, as I said, the, uh, in our status report as of September last year, the 818 um, that we published then, they were all targeting operation operational commencement in the mid-2020s. Very so soon, yeah. Between 2022 and 2027, mm. from memory. Um, so, so, you know, if you've got the right circumstances um, and that they're, they're going to be the first opportunities that are actually invested in, um, you can be operating uh, quite, quite quickly. And that's what we're seeing. We're seeing, we're seeing a rush to gain market share, uh, to grab market share, because I think the, the clean hydrogen mm -hmm. market is going to be enormous. We know that countries like Japan, for example, yeah. are very actively looking for suppliers, reliable suppliers of, of, of relatively low cost and, and certainly low emissions uh, hydrogen. There's already been a shipment from Saudi Arabia mm -hmm. uh, to Japan. September 2020, yep. I think it was. That That's right. That's right. Um, of I think it was shipped as ammonia in, mm, in that case. Yeah. Uh, uh, there's been, uh, uh, Japan are also looking to Brunei. They're looking to Australia. They're investing in, in pilot projects, potentially a commercial project mm. in the south of Australia. There was an announcement just today by the Australian government um, of $1.5 billion to support investment in um, hydrogen and other, other, other industries in the north of Australia, in Darwin, in, in, in uh, the port of Darwin. Um, so I've got no detail on that yet. I've literally just seen the release on, on TV. So, so I, think, I, think, um, I think it can scale up very quickly. Uh, having said that, getting to 500 million tonnes per year in 30 years, is difficult, um, but I think certainly we can scale up quite quickly. Blue hydrogen has the advantage of being very familiar technology. It operates at large scale uh, quite naturally. And I think with uh, the Middle that, East- And that's to our advantage. With the Middle East, if there's that strategic um, push, which there clearly, clearly is um, in several mm. countries, then astonishing things can happen um, once right. the government has its sights set on something, um, especially with those, uh, with those setups, those top-down um, setups, and um, incredible, incredible things do happen. So I think the confidence there um, is mm. is is warranted. Just one more question, just before before we wrap up, because I don't want to use up too much mm. of your time. But how do you see um, concerns that? And again, these are not brand new concerns. I just wanted your opinion on them. Um, the concerns mm. that CCS enables the locking in of fossil fuels, that it shouldn't be uh, blue hydrogen should not be called a clean hydrogen it's just green that should be considered that way that we have leakage issues that aren't getting the attention that's required and so on how how do you see best mitigating those concerns as this market grows look i think what matters with hydrogen regardless of its color is its life cycle emissions intensity that's mm. that's the metric that matters we're doing it for climate mitigation purposes um, so clean hydrogen in order to in order to meet the standard being called clean hydrogen has to have a very low life cycle emissions intensity. So I think what we need is very clear standards to be established. And I'm, you know, based upon the, the life cycle emissions intensity of green hydrogen and blue hydrogen, done properly, they're the same. Mm. Right? They're two, two and a half, something like that, kilograms mm -hmm. per kilogram of, of hydrogen. Uh, that they're the same. Blue hydrogen is just as low emissions as green hydrogen. 
you can have higher emissions green hydrogen than blue hydrogen depending yes. on the life cycle emissions associated with the construction of uh, uh, your, your solar PV mostly quite emissions intense. So, so the, the, the important metric here is life cycle emissions intensity. I think what we need is very clear standards to be developed around what qualifies as low emissions hydrogen. Mm -hmm. um, and then there needs to be the processes in place to verify, to verify that. Uh, so some of those, in some jurisdictions, those processes are, or the elements of those processes are already there because there's good carbon accounting and, and validation and verification mm -hmm. requirements across any industry. Um, but I think what we need is a nice self-contained process and standard that says, okay, to be called blue hydrogen or green hydrogen for that matter, your life cycle emission intensity must be less than whatever the number is, two and a half, two and a half kilos per kilo, something like that. Um, and, and you must have it verified according to these methodologies and processes. Um, and that so must I think be that's, done quickly that's as critical. the market grows. Because this is, you know, it can't, the, well, the growth of the market right. can't out accelerate the, the formation of these regulations and the structure required to make sure it's, it is monitored right. as cleanly as possible. That's right. but, but I think what will happen is, is um, the market will demand that uh, anyone, anyone selling and providing low emissions hydrogen also provide evidence of its emiss life cycle emissions intensity. Yeah. So the market will demand that, otherwise why would you, they won't yeah. buy the hydrogen, right? It's, it, 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 but but the, the, reg, the clear regulation and standards will assist that, that process to make sure that the same sorts of standards and processes are applied ideally, ideally globally. Uh, I, think, I think that really will, that really will um, solve that issue and arguably uh, and see what you think about this but i think they'll end up taking longer than growing this pipeline getting some kind of global standard in place that truly is adhered to will take longer than the massive growth we're seeing in the pipeline so far well a global standard yes but i think i i think what we'll see is we'll see local regulation and local standards yes. in developed in certain countries now particularly those that already have advanced carbon accounting mm. uh uh processes and standards and requirements because there's nothing unique about making hydrogen from fossil fuels or CCS. It's mm. the same principles apply that much of the same processes can apply in terms of calculating emissions intensity and, 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 and the verification that's required as well. So, um, and before that comes, of course, you'll have the buyers of blue hydrogen doing their own due diligence. So they won't just take your word for it. Mm. Um, you know, my guess is they would get you know, the likes of, you know, the big four, one of the big four exactly. to go in and audit suppliers uh, in order, because they'll have carbon accounting practices pretty much. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, they'll send in the, one of the, one, the, their auditors to audit the supplier uh, and make sure that the life cycle emission intensity is as, um, a, a, as advertised. And that, that'll certainly be the case with ESG on the rise as it is, uh, I say on the rise, on the surge almost. And, uh, mm. and we're seeing a lot more public scrutiny as we saw with Shell um, in Absolutely. the courts and the impact. And, and all these things are certainly tumbling in, in, in the similar sort of direction. Alex, thank you so much for joining us. I feel we could we could talk for another several hours on this. We you touched on carbon accounting then. I have so many questions about that when it comes to that when it comes to that uh, mm. that pipeline as well. So hopefully you can join us again and we can dive in and be really interesting to see what those pipeline numbers are next time we talk as well. Well, have a look at our status report, which will be released in October this year. I think um, uh, it's a good read and it it'll is. update the pipeline. <laughs> it is. It's, it's got a lot of yeah. information on there and on a market that's changing very very fast. So thank you very much, mm. Alex, and speak to you soon. You're welcome. Thank you. Thanks.